All right, hello everyone. We are here live again today with the Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things podcast show. And as always, I have another extraordinary guest. I have Darcy Gector. She is the first and only woman who has kayaked the Amazon River from source to sea. And I'm so thrilled to have her here and hear about this whole journey. So welcome, Darcy. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks for having me. So I want to start from the very beginning, before we get into your full journey. When did you first fall in love with just being outside, adventure, kayaking? Was there kind of a pivotal moment when you were a young kid that you were like, this is something I really enjoy? Um, I always really liked being outside from a young kid, and that's kind of what my family did together, you know, whether it was just playing in the backyard or skiing, like that was my parents' big thing was going skiing all the time. And so being outdoors was always a big part of my life. And I think maybe one of the pivotal moments for me when I saw how valuable being outdoors could be, um, my I went to Aspen High School and Aspen Middle School. And every year they do like a one week long outdoor education trip. And in eighth grade, we had to do like a 40 mile backpacking loop and ropes courses and some other stuff. And I really, they chose the group for you. And I didn't have any of my friends in my group. And I went into the trip, like feeling really bummed out that none of my friends were there. And I really had the best trip and I met new people. I became really good friends with them. We had a lot of challenges with the backpacking and some ropes courses. And that was the first time in my life that I thought, wow, this is such a great learning experience being outdoors. And then from there, I just tried to capitalize on that whenever I could. And I. I enjoyed school pretty well too, but I definitely enjoyed learning outside much more than I enjoyed learning inside. And what made you choose, I mean, you do a lot of different outdoor activities, but why kayaking as kind of the main one to focus on? Um, I started kayaking when I was 19 years old. So I sort of got into it late in life, I would say. Um, and I think what appealed to me most about it is pretty soon after I started kayaking, I started traveling to kayak. And the first time I ever left the United States, I went to Nepal to go kayaking and I was 20 years old and it was such an eye opening experience. And I really love getting to see places that very few other people had seen, you know, the bottoms of these river canyons that were super remote. And um, obviously there are other ways to do that that maybe don't require lugging like an 80 pound kayak around, but I wasn't creative enough to figure that out back then. So I just sort of thought to myself, like kayaking is the way that I want to see the world. And so uh, flash forwarding a little bit uh, older. So you're 35 and you decide you're owning a business at this point and you decide that you want to kayak the Amazon River. Can you take us through uh, that mental process of deciding that this is what you wanted to do? Why at that age? Why at that time? And why that place? Well, so it wasn't actually my decision. Um, there was a guy named David Midgley, who I'll call Midge from now on. And he is a brilliant computer programmer who lives in London. And at when he was 30 years old, he decided that he felt like he was wasting his life writing code, sitting in front of a computer, and he needed to do one big adventure. So he scoured the adventure archives trying to figure out what it could be. And he thought climbing Everest had been overdone, sailing around the world had been overdone. And then he discovered that uh, more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon from source to sea. And he also discovered that no, none of the people who had descended the Amazon had kayaked the whole thing. They had either rafted or hiked around the whitewater. So he decided he would kayak the Amazon, but he had never kayaked before and he had never been camping before. And he really was not an athlete or an outdoor person. But so he started coming to Ecuador where I run a business called Small World Adventures, guiding whitewater kayakers. And so he came to my business so that he could learn how to become a class five kayaker, which is the hardest classification of runnable whitewater because he wanted to make sure he could kayak the whole thing. So after eight years of training with me and my boyfriend, Don Beveridge, uh, Mid decided he was ready for the whitewater and he invited us to go with him. And, uh, for me, it was kind of an easy yes, because it was a pretty good opportunity. You know, I've been kayaking a long time and I liked adventures and here I was being presented with this opportunity. So it was an easy yes for me. And then also right before we left, uh, Don and 
myself and our third partner had just sold the business, Small World Adventures, and I had had a fight with the new owner and gotten myself and Don fired. So we were like totally unattached, no job, no nothing. And it was kind of a perfect moment to go reinvent ourselves on the Amazon River. And so did you do, I mean, you've been doing this a long time. So you were training someone that wanted to do it. Was there any particular training that you did differently prior to getting ready for this trip? Uh, me personally, no, because I, you know, we kayak pretty much every single day, all winter long for the business. And then we kayak for fun when it's not the business season. And so I did a, a lot of physical training that was just part of my regular life. But what I wish I had done was a lot more like mental and emotional training because I'm sort of a, a flippant decision maker. And when Midge asked if we would go with him, I just said yes. And I didn't really think much more about it. And I didn't think what it would be like to spend 148 days with just two other people kind of being trapped and isolated and having personality differences. And so I was really physically prepared. I was not very well emotionally prepared. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to talk about. And I, you know, you have a new book about this called Amazon Woman, where you're, you depict your whole trip. And I'd love for you to kind of take us through. So it was 148 days. So how did this trip start? What was that like at the very beginning? So at the very beginning, we had to find the source of the Amazon, which is hard to do because the Amazon River has a drainage basin the size of the lower 48. And so it's a huge area. And uh, there's a lot of debate about what is the source? Um, basically, we were looking for the longest tributary of the Amazon River. And uh, the Montaro River is the longest tributary. But then we had to even go deeper than that and find the highest elevation feeder stream of the Montaro. So we were basically climbing around on a mountain in Peru at 15,000 feet in elevation saying like, no, there's still water flowing higher than this. And when we started, it was about this wide. And uh, so we just picked a place that we all agreed was the highest flowing water we could find. And then we hiked down it until it was wide enough to float our kayaks in. And then um, we had 25 days of white water and maybe 15, 16 days of that was class five, what Midge had been training for with us. And he, uh, he had a couple of close calls, but he really did remarkably well and it's hard to have like full adrenaline for that many days straight. And he really, he did a great job. But after the 25 days of whitewater, then we switched into sea kayaks and uh, the rest of the trip was flat water. So in those 25 days, like what is a typical day like? I assume they're all different, but are you, are you going for multiple hours and you have to find a place to stop and to rest? Like how does that work? Yeah, so in the white water, we were kayaking usually like eight to 10 hours per day. <clears throat> and um, none of us had ever done the river before. So we were going fairly cautiously. And basically if we couldn't see the bottom of a rapid, we would all get out of our kayaks and walk down the shore to look at it and then decide if it was safe to run. And then, um, yeah, same thing at the end of each day, we didn't know where we were gonna camp. So it was always a bit of a balance between you know, we didn't want to pass a good camp spot when it was getting too close to dark because we didn't know if we'd go into a canyon and not be able to find one. But the flip side of that is we didn't want to stop at three o'clock in the afternoon and waste a bunch of daylight. But so, yeah, we always found decent places to camp. We only had a few nights where we were like huddled on a little rock ledge or something like that. But So at, you said is the first 25 days were the white water and then it was kind of a smoother sailing, if you would say, but it's still 148 days. What do you think was some of the most challenging parts of it? Like, was it more in the beginning, the middle, the end, or was the whole point the whole time? Uh, no, I'd actually say that, you know, the whitewater was very physically challenging, but that maybe was the easiest part of the trip overall, because we were all working as a team. You know, the whitewater, sometimes it was scary, but a lot of times it was fun. Um, we were kind of fresh in the expedition, so we were excited and we didn't, we weren't too sick of each other yet. And then um, when we got, when we first got to the flat water, we were in a place that Peru calls the red zone and it's a really dangerous area because it has a lot of um, 
drug trafficking, like in 2013, Peru overtook Colombia as the number one cocaine producing country in the world. There's a lot of illegal logging um, and there's Shining Path rebels still there. And then there's um, indigenous people who are rightly so very scared of outsiders. And so before we had gotten there, six tourists, like in the two years before we went, six tourists had paddled down this part of the river and two of them got murdered and one more got shot, but he survived. And so we were really scared of this region and we did everything we could, you know, permission letters from the indigenous people and basically explaining to them what we were doing that we just wanted to kayak through and we didn't mean them any harm because that's what they were really afraid of. But anyway, that the red zone was about 30 days. So after the whitewater, we still had like 30 days of kind of time to bond and we were all in this dangerous situation together. So we were still working as a team and getting along. But then after we got out of the red zone, the river was kind of boring. We weren't fearing for our lives either because of white water or because of red zone reasons. And so that's when we started to fight a lot more because we didn't have like a common bond of threat to our life, I think. And so we had maybe a rough 25 days of really a lot of fighting and Midge didn't want to paddle at the pace that I wanted him to paddle at. And I didn't want to except the pace that he wanted to paddle at, you know, kind of really, truly silly things, but they were sort of all consuming at the time. But then again, like the last month got challenging again because tides come up the Amazon River more than 600 miles. And it was always really windy with the wind blowing up river and which made big waves and our sea kayaks were relatively unstable. So the last month of the trip, we kind of were forced to start working as a team again. And that really helped, I think, everybody's morale and you know we're still speaking to each other after all that time so that's good <laughs> i love that if you are watching yeah. live and you want to uh type in a question you definitely can um so before we go to the teamwork part i was uh reading a little bit about your book that when you went towards i think the red zone that you had to cut your hair to look like a boy is, is that correct that yeah. is correct can you yeah. talk about that and 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 what happened um, why you did that and how that helped. So, yeah, like I said before, I'm kind of a rash decision maker. So I just said yes to the expedition with Midge. And I, I, as we were making our way down the whitewater, I started doing some research and realizing just how dangerous the red zone was. So I really started questioning whether it was worth the risk, you know, is like the glory of potentially becoming the first woman to kayak the Amazon worth dying over and obviously the answer to that is no but i was trying to figure out how dangerous it really was how much risk i was willing to accept and so in this one town we stopped at it during the whitewater i just went into a hair cutting place and asked the lady to cut off my hair because my line of thinking at that point was like maybe if everyone thinks we're a group of three guys they'll be less likely to mess with us or you know they I think women just have to worry about some things that men don't have to worry about in scary situations. And so this was probably irrational and I'm not sure if it actually helped, but this was like my way of trying to mitigate some of my own fears before we went in. And um, I think it, I think I pulled off a pretty good boy with my hair all cut <laughs> off. <laughs> so it might've worked, but I actually think that like when we got to villages and I started speaking to people and they realized that I was a woman, that it really actually helped put them at ease because the more we went down the red zone, we realized that the people were just as scared of us as we were of them. And as soon as like we were able to convince them that we weren't actually a threat to them. Then they were super nice. They were offering us food. We could camp on their beaches and they were really very kind people. We just had to get past this whole idea that we were really scared of them and they were really scared of us. And how, I mean, cause they're indigenous people. So I, I would assume that they do not speak English. Is that correct? That is correct. So they were speaking Spanish, which is their second language. And we were speaking Spanish, which is our second language, but we were able to, to communicate fairly well in Spanish, but yeah, their their local language was Ashaninka, and we didn't understand any of that, and they didn't speak any English. So, so when you're talking about later, and you're talking about this kind of teamwork thing, I know I have friends who do um, outrigging canoe, and they've talked about uh, you know the teamwork that's needed in that. How did you 
work as a team, whether it was on the water or off, what do you think helped you all to come together when you really needed it? Yeah, so with our team, we, as the challenges grew, we did a lot better. You know, our lowest moments as a team was when we didn't really have any any outside threats. So I think we just sort of created some turmoil within ourselves, you know, to compensate for the fact that there's nothing else we were worried about. And uh, yeah, I think it was probably luck um, that we were able to come together so much when we were facing danger. But I think it also helped that for our entire relationship with Midge, Don and I had been like his coaches and his mentors. And so in in dangerous or life-threatening situations, he was more willing to sort of let us take the lead and more willing to work as a team when, at, whereas when nothing was really threatening, like all three of us just kind of wanted to be on our own program and we really butted heads when the others wouldn't get on board, so. Now, was there ever a point where you thought to yourself, you were not going to make it, you were not gonna, you should turn around, you should stop doing this, or you might not live? Um, there was two situations where I was worried that we might not live. One was a dam construction site during the whitewater section. And we were in the middle of a really deep canyon, like a couple thousand feet deep. And they were using dynamite to build a road into the river where they were building a dam. And we had actually negotiated like two and a half hours of dynamite stoppage with the project managers so that we could paddle through. But the because they had blown off blown up so much of the cliff and made the riverbed so unnatural. We had to walk around a number of rapids and because it was kind of sheer cliffs, we had to use ropes to haul the boats around and to rappel down. And so it was taking us a lot longer and like about three and a half hours in, we still hadn't seen any workers. So I assume they still hadn't seen us. And uh, I was getting really worried that they would start dynamiting again, which would have certainly killed us. It was also really hard white water in this section and Midge, uh, in the middle of this canyon, Midge fell into what we call a hole, which is like a hydraulic where all the water is pouring over a rock or something and then reversing back on itself. So things aren't moving down river anymore. He's just stuck in this one spot. And I really thought at that moment that if he had to swim free of his kayak, that he would have died because it was a section of really continuous like class five and class six rapids and class six means unrunnable. But I don't wanna you know, give away the book too much, but Mid survived, he, he made it out of the hole. <laughs> but that was one moment where I definitely, you know, I was mad at myself for getting myself in that situation and thinking, oh, we're so stupid to pedal through this canyon. Luckily, it worked out for the best. Yes. No, that is it's really good to hear, obviously. So as you're going through this, you know, like you said, it was 148 days. Um, when you were coming at the end of this, what was the feeling? Is it is it like if somebody runs a, a marathon, like, I did it. I feel great. Did you feel like, what next? Were you like, thank God I, I made it? What was kind of your feeling overall once you kind of made that final round to complete it? So... Before we started the expedition, we were looking at maps and mapped out a point between the North Bank and the South Bank of the Amazon River, because at the mouth, it's like more than 150 miles wide. And so we knew we wanted to be near the South Bank, and we had drawn a line between the farthest jutting out pieces of shore to figure out where we could technically say that we were in the Atlantic Ocean. And it, the conditions were really rough, like 15 foot waves and wind and tides. And so when we got out there, we were just basically like staring at the GPS, trying to make it past this little point. And then when we made it, you know, it was too rough to stop and high five and everything. So we all just kind of said like, yay, and it turned to shore and started paddling to shore, which we were like about two miles offshore. But once we finally made it to the beach, I think we all had a couple minutes of real, you know, being really excited, a huge feeling of accomplishment and happy to have survived and made it all the way to the ocean. But then for me, it was a pretty immediate letdown. And I had this feeling of, you know, kind of, oh crap, what are we gonna do tomorrow? Because for five months, our lives had been boiled down to just really simple living. We knew every single day we were gonna wake up, have breakfast, go kayaking. And we had this common goal, like we had a purpose. And then especially for Don and I, because we didn't have any jobs to go back to or a house to go back to or anything, once we actually had finished, I really had a sort of a sense of 
of loss and I got lost. I had lack of direction. I don't have any goal anymore. And so I had a most of the night I spent on that beach kind of sad until I just decided to start thinking about what the next adventure could be. And then that made me happy again. Yeah. And I think that's a, uh, an important point that I think a lot of people have felt, especially with big adventures of this kind where you're, you have this purpose, you're doing something and now it's over and it's like, well, what, what happens now? Um, and I'm curious, you know, having done this whole thing and again, being a, a kayaker your whole life, what did you learn most about yourself in this journey and this process? Um, I guess I'll start with the, the negative thing I learned about myself is I, I have known most of my life that I'm really impatient and that's something that I try to work on a lot. And I went into the expedition thinking I had uh, figured it out pretty well. But I realized on the expedition that I still am very impatient and I have this problem where I expect people to <clears throat> do things when I want them to do it and do it exactly how I want them to do it. And so I learned that I have a lot of work to do on that still. And kind of more important for the big picture, um, and I talk about this a lot in the book, but especially because we lost our jobs and the business right before the trip, I started the, the Amazon expedition thinking, this will be the perfect last adventure. And then Don and I can start doing all these things that we were supposed to have done that, you know, not so much our parents, but a lot of people in our lives have been pressuring us to get what they call a real job, get some security for the future, get a house, get some kids. So I really went into it thinking like, yes, I'm gonna convince myself to want all these things as we do this last big adventure. And I, I failed to convince myself of that, but I did kind of work through my own feelings of insecurity for not doing what I was supposed to do and realized that just making myself happy was more important than making you know society happy, which I don't even know what that means. And I don't even know why I would care to make society happy, but. Yeah, and you and I were talking uh, before we started recording about that. Um, you know, I've been doing this show a long time, and I was telling you that one of the things that I've learned uh, is that really there's so many ways to live your life. And as long as you are doing it for yourself and you're not, I always say, harming anyone um, to do it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is your advice to people that want to take a trip like this or they want to do something that's maybe sounds crazy or different? Um, and there's a lot of people telling them, oh, that's ridiculous. Like you need to be an adult. You need to get this job, have kids and do all these things. Because um, I think a lot of people hear that. What advice would you give to them in going after what it is that they want to do as well as living a life that they enjoy? Well, I I do understand how hard it can be to sort of go against either what everybody else is doing or what everybody else is telling you that you should be doing. And it's, you know, it, the easiest thing to do is just do what you're supposed to do. And then nobody questions your life. But I think in order to make ourselves happy, whether we want to do something big, like kayak the Amazon, or even just like a little change in your life that you think would make you happier is to, my advice would be to not be afraid to fail. I know for myself, and I think a lot of people, don't take that step because the fear of failure is pretty big. And when you're going against the grain, I think the risk of failure is that much bigger because then people, if you do mess up or you do fail, then people can look at you and say, see, you know, I, I told you, you shouldn't have done this, or you should have been doing what you're supposed to do. And this never would have happened, but everybody fails all the time. And, you know, especially with social media, we don't see that anymore. We think that everybody's lives are perfect except for our own. But it is important to remember that people fail all the time and we all can learn something from every failure. They can make us stronger. And for me, you know, in my life and people I know, I don't know anyone who's regretted going for what they want to do, even if it hasn't worked out, even if, you know, it didn't work out the way they thought or didn't work out at all. They were always so happy that they at least tried. And most of the time, the people in my life have found a way to make it work. They might fail five times, 10 times. They keep trying, they try different angles, different approaches. And um, yeah, the feeling of doing what you wanna do and you know, a feeling of satisfaction that you're living life true to yourself is gonna make you way happier than uh, fitting the mold, I guess. Yes, I could not agree more. I love that, Darcy. 
Um, you have, like I was saying earlier, again, if anyone has any questions, you can post them in the comments. You have a book out talking about this, which is called Amazon Woman. Uh, what made you decide, because you were telling me earlier, you did this trip in 2013. So what made you decide to write a book about this? Um, and what was that process like for you? Uh, so I decided to write a book because I felt like I finally did something worth writing a book about. And I've always enjoyed writing, but it's always been for me short articles in a kayaking magazine or something along these lines. And as we were getting ready to do the Amazon, Dawn pointed out to me that I had the chance to become the first woman to do this and this would be a unique thing. And I thought, yeah, you know, you're right. This could be something worth writing a book about. So I went into it, you know, I kept a journal because I thought when I got home, maybe I would write a book. And as I started writing, like I'm not a very good person when it comes to introspection. I'm not very good at that. I'm not very good at talking about my feelings and being open about all that stuff. So the first, the early drafts of the book were very much like we woke up, we had breakfast, we went kayaking and we went to bed. And you know, all the feedback was like, this is so boring. Who cares that you kayak the Amazon? That's not really why people want to read your story. So I think part of the reason that it took me so long is it really took a long time to convince myself to open up more and make it more of a memoir and not just a cut and dry adventure story. It also took a long time because I was totally clueless about the writing process and the publishing process when I went in and I didn't know what a literary agent was or that you needed one if you wanted to get a publisher. And um, so it was just like a really long and slow learning curve, but I got lucky. I took, you know, I took a self publishing class and one of the instructors said, you cannot self publish, you know, this story has a chance at a real publisher. And I had some people who definitely helped me along the way and helped me get to where I am, which is now I did procure a publisher and the book is actually out, which is a great feeling. Which I love it. I'm going to put uh, in the comments real quick for those of you that want to um, check it out and check out the book. That is her book. And then this is also her website, which I told her is great. Her On her website, she says she's an author, adventurer, and badass woman. So I love that line as well. And uh, Darcy, we did have a, a question, which is a great one, and I wanted to have you answer it. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us. After spending so much time in such a different environment, was it a shock coming home? It was definitely a shock coming home um, for a variety of reasons. You know, one, I was used to only talking to Don and Midge. And then, you know, we did talk to the local people whenever we would get to a village at night. But having a very slow, a very small and kind of weird social circle definitely made me lose what few social skills I had before the trip. And so I found it really hard to like go to a dinner party or to socialize with friends for the first couple of months after coming back because I just had no clue what to talk to them about. And um, yeah, getting back to having internet every day and having cell service every day, that, um, th you know, these were things that I missed a little bit on the trip. But as soon as I got back to being immersed by them, I realized how life how nice life really was without all the hustle and bustle, the pressure to respond immediately when someone sends you a Facebook message and all these sorts of things. And so, yeah, I'm probably still a little awkward and trying to adjust and it's been almost seven years. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you don't have to. So I think it's, again, you can do what feels right to you. Do you have another, I mean, obviously the book is something you are uh, really working on promoting and doing more with, but is there another trip that you have that you want to do or that you're planning for or something you want to do in the future at any point? Yeah. So Dawn's trip that Don is still my boyfriend, so we our relationship survived the trip, which is good. And now he wants to do Source to Sea of the Longest River in Antarctica, which is 20 miles long, and there won't be any malaria, and it won't be overly hot. So that's on the schedule. But my next big trip um, is there's a plateau in northern British Columbia that the locals call the Sacred Headwaters, and there's three rivers that uh, originate on this plateau. And you can do source to see on all of them. And they're not long like the Amazon, but each one is about 500 miles long. And this part of British Columbia just has a lot of appeal to me because it's super remote. There's not that many people. So you get to see a lot of bears and moose and other critters. And uh, it just the appeal to this trip for me is that we would get to go be off the grid again for probably three months and 
that's just, I guess I don't want to live my entire life in isolation. And I'm learning that more and more right now during our current situation. But I do love having these extended periods of uh, cutting off from civilization. And it's just a nice time to think about what really, what really is important. Yeah, I love that. If people want to learn more about you, connect with you, get your book, we've put the, the links in the comments, but where can they do that? Where's the best, the best place to get it? Um, the best place to buy the book, I think, is IndieBound.org, and they're a really cool organization that connects people with their local bookstores, and when that's not possible, <clears throat> they'll ship you the book. Um, if you do want to do, read it on Kindle or audiobook, you can get it off Amazon, and you can also visit DarcyGector.com for more places to pick up the book. I love it. And one of the questions I like to ask on this show um, at the end of every episode is what is one word or quote or mantra that you try to live by every single day? So I think what serves me the best is saying yes. And that can be something big like saying yes to mids to do the Amazon. And it could also be something small. You know, if if my mom texts me in the morning and says, do you want to go for a walk? You know, just say yes, do everything that I can possibly do to connect with people, to do things that I feel are enriching my life. And I find when I get in a, in a uh, time in my life when I'm kind of hiding and saying no, it's like that's the kind of the darker periods. And when I just say yes to whatever comes my way, I feel a lot happier. I love that. We have uh, one more question. Uh, Matt says, hi, Dars. Do you need crew for your next adventure? <laughs> so if so, is that a yes or no? And if so, how could people connect with you to do that? Well, yes, I need a crew, but I'm very selective. You know, after being forced to spend 148 days with Dawn and Midge, <laughs> I'm going to be more selective about who I spend my time with. <laughs> but if people want to connect with me, um, Facebook is great, just Darcy Gector or Instagram, also under the same name. And yeah, always happy to have any kind of crew for small and big adventures. And Right now, I'm really enjoying my little backyard adventures. So if anyone wants to join me but stay six feet apart, I'm open to that. <laughs> I love it. Well, congratulations to you, Darcy, on all the hard work that you did on that trip. Again, it's it's pretty impressive to not only do that, to kayak the Amazon, but to do be the first and only female at this point. Um, and I'm sure you're leading the way for other women that want to do the same. Um, and congratulations to you for now having done this book as well. Again, the book is Amazon Women, uh, Woman. Um, you can check it out. Uh, it's really detailed, really goes through her whole trip. And uh, I thank you so much for being here, Darcy, and sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for having me, Carrie. I appreciate it.